Scores of people disappear in a great city like San Francisco every year. Many walk out deliberately to get away from lives they find unbearable. But by the middle of 1985, Paul Cosner's disappearance was inexplicable. He had left his home the previous November to hand over his car to a man who had just bought it. Cosner was never seen again, but the next day there were strange noises on his answer phone. police were called in. As Cosner's friends told them, there seemed no reason for him to want to walk out of his life. He's a, he's a healthy individual. There's nothing physically wrong with him, nor is there anything mentally wrong with him. He is uh, a happy person, not given to any kind of uh, bouts of depression or despondency. The more the police looked into Paul Cosner's background, the more it seemed certain he had been the victim of some crime. Soon, his sister was openly expressing the fears that everyone had. I'm afraid that the person wanted the car and um, maybe tried to rob Paul and, and stole the car, put his body somewhere. I don't know. I don't think a car would be worth it, but I don't know. On Sunday, the 2nd of June, 1985, customers in the South City Lumber Store in San Francisco saw a young Asian man acting suspiciously. They warned an assistant who called the police and then followed the young man outside. He was carrying a vice which he had shoplifted. A police car arrived within seconds and the assistant pointed out the young man who had put the vice into his car's boot. He ran off. The policeman gave chase, but soon lost him. As he returned to the car, he found a bearded man standing by it. The man said that the boy was working for him and that there must have been some mistake. The policeman asked the man to open the boot, and in it he saw a pistol with a silencer. Since these are illegal in most American states, he asked the man to come to the police station with him. There the man showed his driver's license, which gave his name as Robin Scott Stapley. He repeated that he did not know the boy, having only just asked him to do some work for him. But when the police ran a computer check on the Honda's number, they discovered that it certainly did not belong to Mr. Stapley. Ominously, it was registered in the name of the missing Paul Cosner, and was the car he had gone off to hand over. Mr. Stapley had some explaining to do, but as the police prepared to question him, he asked for a pencil and paper. After writing a few words, he took a capsule and then slumped forward unconscious. Thinking that he had had a heart attack, the police rushed him to a hospital. There he was found to be effectively brain dead and put on a life support system. Doctors diagnosed that the capsule had contained cyanide. Meanwhile, the police had checked the driving license and discovered that the man was not Robin Stapley. The real Robin Stapley lived in San Diego, and he had been missing since February. They also found a disturbing report that, shortly after he had disappeared, Stapley's camper van had been involved in a minor collision. A young Chinese man had been driving. The Honda was now thoroughly searched. There were two bullet holes in the front seat, two spent bullets and some bloodstains on the fabric. The 
worst fears of Cosner's family and of the private detective they had hired to try to track him down seemed to have come true. I would assume that this was probably a way of someone obtaining a car to use in their illegal activities. And I assume that uh, because the time has gone by that Mr. Cosner is no longer alive. Working on discarded receipts found in the car, the police discovered the name of Charles Gunnar. He lived near Wisleyville in Calaveras County, about 150 miles north of San Francisco. His house was outside the town and little was known there about him. But the local sheriff, Claude Ballard, reported that he suspected that Gunnar and a Chinese youth named Charles Ng, with whom he lived, might have been involved in selling stolen property. They had appeared in local towns with furniture that belonged to a young couple named Lonnie Bond and Brenda O'Connor, who lived in a neighboring house. Gunnar had claimed that the couple had moved to Los Angeles and left the furniture with him to pay off a debt. Nothing had been heard of Bond or O'Connor or their baby since then. The police now checked Charles Gunnar's fingerprints. He turned out to have a criminal record for burglary and grand larceny in Mendocino County, where he had jumped bail. But his real name was not Charles Gunnar. It was Leonard Lake. Further investigation into Lake's background showed that his younger brother Donald had been reported missing in July 1983. Charles Gunnar was the name of Lake's best man. He had not been seen for several months. Sheriff Ballard now obtained a search warrant for the house in Blue Mountain Road where Lake and Ng had been living. On the morning of Tuesday, the 4th of June, officers from San Francisco joined the local police. They drove up to the small two-bedroom ranch which stood in three acres of land. At first, this seemed ordinary enough. But then the police got inside and reached the main bedroom. There were hooks in the ceilings and walls and other things which, as the police later described, made them think that some sort of bondage had taken place. Screw holes on each corner of the bed were, and the, and the eye bolts that, from, in the dresser that we probably feel that it's possible he could have tied them down with those. The box was found containing chains and shackles. A wardrobe was full of women's clothes. police also found some expensive video equipment in one of the rooms. When the serial numbers were checked, this was found to belong to a San Franciscan couple named Harvey and Deborah Dubs. They had disappeared with their 16-month-old son, Sean, almost exactly a year before. They had left their San Francisco apartment without taking any belongings. But when their credit cards had started to be used, the police had made a televised appeal for help. We would like to, you know, the people that use the credit card, if they're not involved in the disappearance of the Dubs family, we again, you know, would like to assure them that they're not going to be prosecuted for, you know, buying a dinner with a stolen credit card. We're a lot more interested in finding out what happened to the Dubs family. But there was no response. As a police task force was assembled, it was noticed that there were signs of digging outside with a long trench apparently intended for a telephone line. There were traces of ash and what might have been bone. Also outside were an incinerator and a breeze block bunker which had been built into the side of the hill. The bunker seemed to be equipped as a fallout shelter with stores, guns and military uniforms. At one end were shelves on which were manacles, handcuffs, and three knives. But the real horror lay in a windowless cell concealed by a false wall. 
inside that room there was a makeshift bed that had a small mattress on it and uh, uh, some blankets. There was toilet paper in there, uh, personal effects for a female such as makeup, and also uh, a small plastic bucket uh, used as a toilet, we believe. What the officer did not reveal was that the room also had a one-way mirror and hooks positioned so that a body could be secured on the bed. On the wall of the small cell were 25 photographs of young girls, some of them never identified. Elsewhere in the house, the police found videos showing some of them being stripped, shackled, beaten and tortured. One of these was recognized as Deborah Dubbs. Over the next few days, the remains of an increasing number of bodies were found. But the precise number could at first only be speculation. I would make it uh, a fair guess the people that I'm missing in my county, the people that uh, Chief Murphy is missing from San Francisco, it would exceed 20 people. There's a lot of digging to be done. Identification was almost impossible, since all the bodies had been cut up with a chainsaw and then burned in pieces in the incinerator. police chiefs continued to be cautious as to numbers. I'm saying at this point there are approximately 25 people who at one time or another had some dealings with the lake in Ng, especially the lake, that are at this particular time unaccounted for. The grisly story soon became national news, and local church leaders tried to comfort those with missing girls. Our hearts go out to all the families who are wondering is my daughter among them? Is my daughter alive? Is my daughter dead? However, it was established that one grave did contain the remains of a man, woman, and baby. Whether it was the Dubs or the Bond O'Connors could never be ascertained. A friend of the Bond O'Connors talked about how Brenda had become increasingly concerned about her neighbors. She was worried about going back up there that their neighbor was strange and had sexual videotapes and that he had on several occasions propositioned them to come over and watch these and that she feared for her life. On the 6th of June, as the investigation got underway, Lake's life support system had been switched off. By now, the police had built up a detailed background of the man and his diary had been found, giving them an horrific picture of his last two years of killing. Lake had been born in San Francisco in 1946. He, his retarded brother and two sisters, had been rejected by both his parents, who were alcoholics at an early age. They were raised by their grandmother, who was a strict disciplinarian. Lake had become obsessed by sex. In return for protecting his sisters from the assaults of Donald, the retarded brother, he enjoyed their sexual favors and took nude photographs of them. Lake had escaped from this claustrophobic family background by joining the Marines. He served for seven years, including two tours in Vietnam. But despite later boasting about his exploits, he never saw combat. He seemed adept at hiding his fantasies of sex and violence. After leaving the Marines, he lived for five years in San Diego and seemed a model citizen. He taught, worked as a volunteer firefighter, and devoted time to charities. He had married a girl named Clara Lynn Balash, nicknamed Cricket, in a bizarre ceremony which included a goat made up as a unicorn. The couple had moved back to Mendocino County, just over the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. The marriage had broken up, but it was to Cricket 
that Lake wrote his last note, asking to be forgiven for what he was about to do. But the model citizen Lake became increasingly convinced that the world was doomed to perish in a nuclear holocaust. He began to mix with military enthusiasts and survivalists, practicing self-defense and living off the land. Lake and Gunnar acquired the ranch near Wisleyville, and it was here that Lake began to live permanently after he had been obliged to flee from Mendocino after being involved in a burglary. By the end of 1984, Charles Gunnar had disappeared and Lake had taken over his identity. The diary made it clear that Lake's murderous career had begun well before he had moved to the ranch. He had been a member of many communes and survivalist camps and at one of these he had murdered his brother Donald. Lake had begun to fantasize about the coming Holocaust, which would destroy most of humanity. He devised a plan called Operation Miranda, in which he would stockpile food, clothing and weapons at the house in the hills. His bizarre sexual fantasies were also fed by the red light district of San Francisco and he envisaged kidnapping girls who would be kept as his sex slaves and used to breed a new world population. At some point while living in San Francisco, Lake met Charles Ng. He became a frequent visitor to the house. Lake's fantasies now began to be put into action. People would be lured to the house. Any men or babies would be killed immediately, while the women were kept for a time, stripped, shackled and sexually abused until their captors grew tired of them. Despite these attempts to live out his fantasies, Lake, like many serial killers, had been aware of the ultimate hopelessness of his position. The thrill of capturing and killing his victims soon wore off. By the time he was captured by the police in San Francisco, Lake was deeply depressed and ready to commit suicide. His young friend was made of sterner stuff. Born on Christmas Eve, 1961, the son of wealthy Hong Kong Chinese parents, Ng seems to have been a classic poor little rich boy who lacked for nothing and took to petty thieving and other juvenile delinquency to give his life some excitement. Involved in a hit-and-run accident in September 1979, he avoided prosecution by joining the U.S. Marines. But within two years, he had gone absent without leave, after an arms robbery from his barracks. A short while later, he was arrested by an FBI SWAT team at a derelict motel in Mendocino, where he had holed up with Leonard Lake after a robbery. Lake managed to go on the run. Ng spent almost three years in the federal prison at Leavenworth. Released in June 1984, he seems to have gone straight back to join Lake at the ranch near Wisleyville. After two weeks of investigation at the house, police had unearthed nine bodies and some 40 pounds of human bones. From licenses and other papers found in the house, the police were sure that the remains of Paul Cosner and Robin Stapley were among them, together with the two missing families. There were also the photographs of a total of 25 girls, some of whom were never identified. But as the investigation at the house uncovered its gruesome haul of bodies and remains, it became clear that without other evidence, the full count would never be known. In 
and the authorities were only too aware that the only person who might be able to provide that evidence had disappeared. Unless uh, Ying is found uh, to corroborate any, any stories of how many, uh, it's going to be very difficult to really say how many and who it was. A wanted poster was issued initially detailing interstate flight following a burglary rather than murder. An Ing's description was given on television and in the press. Ing was traced to Chicago, but he fled before police reached his hotel. They suspected that he must be heading for Canada since he had family there, but for the next few weeks there were no sightings. Then, on Saturday, the 6th of July, 1985, a security guard in the Hudson's Bay Company department store in Calgary, Alberta, noticed a young Oriental man putting food under his jacket. As the guard went to arrest him, the young man pulled out a gun. One of the other shoppers saw the guard grapple with the man. The security guard got shot, but he was over top of him. And um, then someone said, get the police. The young man was overpowered, and police tried to identify him. His property was searched. He was carrying a California driver's license in the name of Charles Ng. And at that point, we uh, fingerprinted the man, and he was uh, subsequently identified positively as being Charles Ng. Immediately Ng's arrest had been announced, a team of San Francisco detectives and lawyers arrived in Calgary to make it clear that they would want him back to face trial for murder once the Canadians had finished with him. The Canadian authorities were initially cautious about the implications. Uh, they're going to interview uh, the suspect uh, with a view to seeing whether in fact he's the guy that they are looking for and uh, whether the evidence that they have supports the charge to make uh, an application for extradition uh, a possibility. On the 16th of December 1985, Charles Ng was sentenced to four and a half years in Canada for attempted murder. A battle for his extradition now began, with Ng's lawyers arguing that Canada's laws forbade a prisoner to be sent back to face a possible death penalty. U.S. lawyers argued that if this were upheld, then Canada would become a haven for every U.S. killer who could get across its border. The case went to the Canadian Supreme Court, and on the 26th of September, 1991, it ruled by four votes to three that Charles Ng should be returned to the United States to face trial for the appalling carnage which he seemed to be implicated in. Some four years later, he was still awaiting trial after several postponements. The police investigation of the house and bunker owned by Leonard Lake had been completed while Charles Ng was in prison in Canada. The horrific evidence found there, together with the videos and diaries which Leonard Lake had kept, established his guilt beyond any doubt. But the police were still unable to say exactly how many people had been slaughtered. Only once Charles Ng comes to trial, and only if he decides to be more cooperative than he has hitherto, will some semblance of the full truth ever emerge about the crimes which were committed in the hills outside San Francisco. <laughs>